Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Eccentric, the makers of the K-Box and the new K-Pulley. Guys, flywheel training's really grown in popularity of late, and although it's something that's been around for a while, the simple reason that it's grown in popularity is because it works. We've been lucky to have a K-Box in our weight room for the past three years, and we've seen some really great things when it comes to improving the athlete's ability to change direction, and then looking at our return to play protocols with different lower body injuries with the student athletes. The love-hate relationship that everyone has with the K-Box is now just going to grow more with the addition of the K-Pulley. The ability to do standing presses, pulls, rip-throughs, and knee drive exercises is just going to be another arsenal to our training and another addition to the love-hate relationship that our student-athletes have with the awesome tools that come from Eccentric. Go ahead and hop over to Eccentric.com today to check out what they have. Guys, I can't recommend it enough, and I guarantee you won't be disappointed not just with the products, but with the awesome customer service that Eccentric provides. Hey, everybody. If you enjoy the podcast and the content that it provides, make sure you hop over and check out the all-new Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is the combination of the CVA SPS community and the Rugby Strength Coach community, bringing you what is sure to be the Internet's leading resource for continuing education for strength and conditioning professionals. Combining these two resources has allowed us to bring some of the best content from some of the best minds in the world together for your one-stop shop to better improve the continuing education for not just yourself, but your entire staff. Bringing together all of the lectures from the Rugby Strength Coach community, along with the lectures exclusively done for the Central Virginia Sport Performance community, and all the lectures performed at the Central Virginia Sport Performance Seminar, make this an absolute must for performance coaches around the world. The world-class lectures at the Strength Coach Network are not all that you'll see as well. The discussion in the forums and the support and the career guidance from some of the top practitioners in the world, from people all over the world, makes this an absolute must and a great place for you to network, learn, and grow as a performance professional. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com and use the code CVASPS, that's C-V-A-S-P-S, to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. We're sure you're going to find great value in the Strength Coach Network and are really excited to have you involved. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com and use the code CVASPS to check it out today. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, I have the absolute pleasure of sitting down and discussing movement skill acquisition with the U of Strength's Jamie Smith. Guys, after an intro and Jamie giving us kind of his background as how we got to and built the U of Strength, we're going to get right into it. We're going to talk about skill acquisition, how they develop their athletes, you know, and go through the whole process really from onboarding to programming to how they adapt their programming, how they progress, you know, in a multitude of different ways. You know, it's, this, is, this is a pretty heavy one. Jamie throws a lot of information out there and really basically shares exactly what they're doing. This is, this is really an awesome talk, guys. I, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's get right to it. James, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. No problem. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. So listen, man, let's let's get right into it. Let's dive right into what you got going on. Uh, let's give, you know, what, like the person and a half that doesn't know who James Smith is, you know, his background, what he's doing, where he's at, and how you got there. Yeah, of course. So first, uh, my name is Jamie Smith, all right, because there's a million James Smiths out there. So I'm Jamie Smith. Uh, I'm the founder head coach of the U of Strength. Uh, we're located in Tingsboro, Massachusetts, which is basically about 40 minutes north of Boston. We're right on the southern New Hampshire, southern New Hampshire line. And so basically it's your typical, you know, your typical story. You know, you played, I played sports, multiple sports all my life, was a college athlete. That career was cut short um, with multiple injuries, multiple surgeries. And I basically ended up in the weight room, fell in love with it. Um, and realized I was lucky uh, the school I went to offered, um, which was rare, but offered exercise physiology. Um, so I kind of felt just fell in love with it and got great advice, had good, good mentors, good coaches early on. Um, and I would spend more time in the weight room than I would in the actual classroom, you know, which was good and bad. But I really I got some good experience, you know, at age 19, 20, 21, really early on. And I was fortunate enough to kind of put me in the right direction. Um, so uh, after college, just to give a little bit, a short uh, 
background information. So after college, um, I worked for Mike Boyle, uh, which he's obviously a legend um, in the field. But I, I worked uh, for Boyle Strength and Conditioning for about two, two and a half years. After that, I wanted to get my feet wet, man. I, I thought the, some advice I got was you've got to go out and experience. It's the same thing I would give young coaches is you got to go out you know, go get internships, go, you know, pay your dues, but figure out what you want to do. Cause there's so many different avenues you can take. Um, and you're not going to know if you just stay comfortable, you stay in the same situation, you got to go out and experience new things. And so what I did is I'm, I'm born and raised from Connecticut. Um, and I'm a big UConn Husky fan. And so I had an opportunity to go down to UConn, um, and coach under Chris West, who at the time was the, uh, head, uh, sport performance coach, whatever you want to call it, but he was the head coach with men's basketball, mm -hmm. men's soccer, and women's soccer. And it was one of those experiences where I went down, we had our first, we had a first meeting. Um, he was very welcoming, said, hey, I can use any help I want as a volunteer position. I reached out and he said, let's, let's meet, let's see if this is a good situation. We ended up talking for six hours, um, kind of explained to him my thought process, thought processes and how I thought I could be beneficial and add value to the program. And it was next day. He said, when can you start? I'm like next day. So we were rocking and rolling and it was, it was really cool. He really gave me the autonomy to make mistakes. Um, but it really helped me develop as a coach. And I, you know, honestly, when he traveled, say it was with men's soccer, I worked with men's basketball and vice versa. So it was really, honestly, it was the best situation a young physical preparation coach could have. Um, and it was the same year, I'll have to throw it in, the same year we won the national championship. It was the last, really the last true Big East title. I'm a huge basketball fan, so it was the last Big East tournament. It was the five days, five games, five wins, and then that straight Cinderella run to the end. It was unbelievable. It was, was just really, really, really cool experience. Um, but anyways, then after that, um, only way I could get a position was to get my master's degree. And for my undergrad, since I spent more time in a weight room, I was, I just didn't think it was going to be a good fit. And so what I did is that I just, I came back up to Massachusetts, you know, worked at some gyms, um, which was important because now being an entrepreneur and being a business owner, which it, I mean, that's half the battle as well with having running your own, you know, private gym. Um, I got to see the, you know, the, the ins and outs of what that takes. Um, and I did that for, you know, a year and a half. Um, and then I, I went on my own. I got lucky. I, I, I went and I got, uh, I went, I transitioned from the basketball world to the hockey world. Um, and I got the, I guess you could call it the head position, but I oversee, uh, all of the, um, uh, Islanders hockey club, all of their, from their, you know, their P so from the real young kids all the way up to our junior level. Um, and I got to basically run all of their in season work. So it was primarily just in season. And what that allowed me to do was if I did a good job and I built relationships, those kids would stick with me in the off season. And it took some time, but after year two, year three, more kids were sticking with me. I'm like, Oh, okay. I can really do something with this. And honestly, that's how the U S strength was, was uh, developed and was born is just kids sticking with me in the spring and summer. And it just year after year after year, just kept growing and growing. And then it got to a point, um, just to give you context, I was training these teams, you know, and this is, these are 15, 15 to 20 kids per team in a square 600 square foot room in the third floor of an ice rink. So it was one of those things where I was very lucky, but it was time I needed to expand. I need to, I needed more space. I, I need, I had, I, I had some visions and I wanted to attack it. And so it was the right time. It was about a year and a half ago. Uh, I opened up the U S strength. We're located, um, in a sports center. Uh, it's called the Tingsboro sports center. And the cool thing about this is that we got 2,000 square feet of weight room space. But part of my lease is that anytime there's a field, a court, outdoor field, uh, whatever it may be, anytime there's an opening, I have full reign. And so I get, I honestly, I have full access to whatever I want to do. And so that's the direction that the U.S. strength is going is that I'm trying to find and, and I'm always evolving and I'm always learning, always trying you know, to find all these different resources like this podcast, um, is that I'm always trying to, I want to, I want to help my athletes and I'm trying to find that right piece to the, to the athletic puzzle, or I'm trying to find that right tool for, you know, for the, for the job. And so one thing that I've noticed is that we have transitioned more and don't get me wrong. When I make this statement and I've had this conversation with other coaches, 
I understand, you know, physical preparation, it is important. I get that, especially for people to understand the con- the context is that I work with six-year-olds to about 20-year-olds. So I work with the youth, and I understand physical abilities are important. But, and we can discuss this a little bit later on, I also see the importance of skill acquisition. I also see the importance of skill adaptation. And so the, one of the unique things here is I have full space, and all we run is group training. So I have a minimum of six to eight guys in every single group, all right? And it's organized by it, – it, right now it's organized by age, but we also have – we also organize it by training age. So kids that I feel are – it is appropriate, they will train with older athletes. Um, I, I just want to make sure it's a good fit for the athletes. So basically we're trying to find a nice blend of physical preparation with skill acquisition um, and to really give this, you know, complete product uh, to the athlete. So – as a guy who works in a similar situation with another different sport from where he truly cut his teeth, being another basketball guy, but working with youth kids in the swimming world yeah. from probably too young to about the right age, I understand exactly where you're coming from with a lot of this. I would love to hear you dive down that rabbit hole of skill acquisition. How are you involved? Now, is this just with the hockey club or is there other clubs involved with this facility? And how are you involved with each of these in a different manner? So right now, so I, this is not with a club. So basically what I do now, everything is, this is the U of strength. There is, this is kids come to me. This is all, this is all private, I guess you could say. So kids come to me. This has nothing to do with the organization. Uh, so with the whole skill, so let me uh, let's let me backtrack a little bit. So because you have a lot of pe- a lot of coaches, a lot of practitioners, a lot of researchers um, state that stay in your lane, and I get that. I respect that. Um, but what I see, and and I'm in a sport complex. I am here. From 6, 7 o'clock in the morning to 11 to 12 o'clock at night, I love this stuff, man. Just like you, just like all the other coaches um, you you uh, you bring on to the podcast, We lo- this is our passion. We love this. And I truly believe that if you're going to be a physical preparation coach, um, you need to be a sport junkie. You need to understand the ins and outs of any single sport you train, okay? And, and I don't care if that goes from swimming, all right? I have a, I have a BMX athlete. I had no idea what BMX was to begin with. He's been with me for a full year now, and I just I died down. And I was on, I'm honest with the kids. I'm like, this is new to me. I'm going to learn everything I can. You can help me. And that's something we can also talk about is that we want these kids part of the process. Process. This is not a dictatorship, all right. And that's that's a common place in these private you know sector is everything is do this, do this, do this, do this. That's not how we operate. Um, but anyways. Um, you need to understand the sport, the ins and outs of the sport. And that's a tough task, especially when you have, if I, I'm looking in a group and I got a, you know, I got a, a baseball player, a soccer, a hockey, a basketball, we do every single sport primarily. All right. We are hockey and basketball. Um, just because from a, from a, a season breakout from a yearly plan, it's very similar. Um, in, in my setup, it's similar. Um, so it kind of makes it a little bit more, efficient and effective. I'm not going to say easy, but efficient and effective um, to run the program that we run, but we can still operate with other sports um, with how we, uh, how we do things. But so with the whole skills, um, when you say that, okay, you know, it's the sport coach's job, I get, I, I, I completely am on the same page, especially when you get to the collegiate and the professional setting. When you look at the youth and the direction that youth is going in, okay, kids are playing one sport, all right, and I'm not going to get into the argument of early specialization and multiple sports. I'm always going to promote multiple sports because I think that's the best thing a kid can do, but sometimes you can't force a kid. If a kid really loves this and this is what he wants to do, because I'm a father now, I have a two-year-old, two-year-old daughter, so my whole perspective has changed, and once you are a parent, it's going to change. Um, and I know I'm going to give her advice. I'm going to offer. But if she really loves it, I'm not going to take that away from her. And so I'm going to try to give her guidance to say try to do as much as you can from a, from a physical and a developmental standpoint. But if she really loves something, I'm not going to take that away. All right. 
So when you see, so a kid is playing the same sport and everyone understand, you know, with overuse and all the, all the problems that happen down the road. Okay. I'm watching these sport coaches work with these cause I'm here. I got a front row seat. Okay. I'm watching these sport coaches and these are big time organizations. Okay. And, and this is a soccer. This is basketball. This is volleyball. This is hockey. I am watching these sport coaches. Some I have relationships with some that I don't, some that are fantastic and some that are just doing it to make a little extra money or to make sure that their son or daughter is in the starting lineup, which is a problem. Um, but it's, they are not getting what they need. They're not, it's, it's, it's not a, it's not a learning environment. And so I see that and, and this has honestly been the past year. I'm going to be completely honest. This has been the past year where I've been trying to make this blend because I'm, I'm, I'm just watching this and I'm seeing kids, you know, in their sport and I'm seeing kids in the weight room and I'm seeing a disconnect. And that frustrated me because one thing with me, just like you, is that I'm going to do everything I can to help this individual. And I don't care what it is. I'm not a person that says, I don't do this. I don't do that. I'm going to find what fits the athlete the best at this, at their, at the moment in time, at the current moment in time. And so when I'm watching these sport coaches interact with the kids, they might have all these different drills and activities set up, but they don't have that motor learning background. They don't have that experience of what it takes for to set the stage for that long-term athletic development, for that progressive development. And so when you, you can set up a great activity, but if you're screaming at the kid, okay, or you're intervening every two seconds because this kid does not look perfect, the kid's not going to get a chance to learn because people, they just don't understand that that's a constraint, okay, and that's going to affect because they're making your practice look bad it's just I see it on a daily basis. So the, when I look at this and I'm saying, okay, am I stepping on sport coach? They should be getting this in their sport. I don't see it in their sport. Yes, maybe they'll get it in their game. But I, I, just, I, I just don't think it's, it's, not from a, it's not motor learning. Okay, And there's a difference between motor learning and motor performance. And with what I work with, 95% of the time, I'm doing motor learning. I am trying to ch- – and let me backtrack. I am trying to appropriately challenge these athletes um, so that we have some type of adaptation. So um, it's just – it's a unique it's a unique situation. It's a unique setup. It's a unique, I guess, concept or idea. Um, but I'm, I'm basically trying to fill in the gaps because when you look at – as the kid gets younger from a, from a PE standpoint, they're not getting PE as frequently, all right? When we have, uh, and I'm not, try- I'm not trying to go off on a tangent, but when we, anytime I have a new athlete come in, and this athlete could be eight years old, this athlete could be 20, okay? If the parents are in the room, we always set up a meeting, an individual meeting. I don't just take payments online and kids just show up. I'm going to have a face-to-face interaction. I'm going to meet the parents. I'm going to meet the, the, uh, the son or daughter. I'm going to establish some type of relationship, and I'm going to establish if this is mom and dad's idea or this is the son or daughter's idea of participating in my program because I'm upfront with every single parent. If this is your mom and dad's idea that really is pushing the kid to do this, this might not be the best place. All right. Because I think that's really important to establish that right from the get so that everyone's on the same page. So then after day one, you know, whatever the son or daughter comes home and you know, they weren't expecting, you know, it to be something that is, kind of like a factory where you go in, everyone does the same thing and you come out because that's just not how I, uh, how we operate. Um, so we establish some type of relationship and I try to get the kid to talk as much as possible. And that's, that, that sometimes is very challenging because this is a, a different environment. All right. A lot of times this is, re- it's a very uncomfortable situation for a 10 year old, 11 year old, 12 year old to engage with a, another coach. And, it, and it's typically not what they uh, typically talk about because when I talk with the athletes, I want to know the name if they have brothers and sisters. I want to know what they do in their free time. I want to know what kind of video games they like. What's their favorite food? You know, what's their favorite subject in school? All right. And so I'm asking, trying to interact with them and trying to create some type of dialogue. And one of my always I ask was, when is the last time you played outside? When was the last time you played with your buddies? And nine out of ten, or nine and a half out of ten of these athletes have no idea. They have no idea the last time they went out 
and played, if they were a basketball guy, played street hockey or they played manhunt or they played, you know, capture the flag or they did something where they, you know, had fun. All right. That is a loss that's gone. <laughs> These kids are not having fun. Um, and so that's something that it was really eye opening and really I, you know, contemplated for a while and was like, all right, I need to I need to figure out a way how I can integrate this into what we do. Um, so, you know, with this whole blending of of the physical capacity, you know, developing, you know, the physical capacities uh, with all these different skills, how I look at it is that I'm never I want to be specific in a sense, but I don't want to be too specific. So a lot of times, you know, you know, I, I, I post a lot of stuff and I try to I try to be when I post and I guess this is a great platform to explain this. Whenever I post something on on uh, the social media platforms, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all this stuff, I'm just trying to be transparent. I'm just trying to say, hey, this is what I do, you know, and this was, is, is helping my athletes. And whether you agree with it or disagree with it, it is what it is. But I'm just trying to be transparent because I think too many people in this field, they think they have a, you know, a secret or there's something. And it's, just, it's not the case. You know, there's been people that are that are much smarter than me doing, you know, much more work and, and, and doing great things. Um, I have nothing to hide. So I try to be as transparent as possible with this. Um, but I don't I don't I'm, it's not a. It's not something where we do something and you got a you got a soccer ball at your foot or you got a basketball in your hand. Okay, where we want to be specific in the sense, and we can talk about this further, where they're 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 reacting to an opponent, and we can kind of talk about you know the, how from this whole um, close to open you know type drills and kind of my view on that. But um, I think it's really important for these kids um, to develop. These 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 skills in a sense of they have they have ownership and they have some freedom, okay? Because their entire life, all right, and that it might it might be different in different parts of the country, but from where I'm located in the Northeast, every kid's life is planned out, everything is structured, and they're basically robots. And I see that on day one, and that's something where I'm like, all right, if I need to fill in a gap, what is this going to be? What am I trying to do? All right. One big thing with me is that I want to build a creative and adaptable. And you hear it. You hear uh, you want to, you know, you want a resilient, you want a robust athlete. Um, and do I think you can do that in the weight room? Yes. But I think that there's other pieces that are missed that are going to really help down the road um, with building that, you know, adaptability, that create that creative thought, the decision making. Um so yeah, that's so basically we're we're you know we're we're blending and I keep saying this, but we're blending the physical capacities with with our skill work. Um, and one thing that we do with this that's a little bit I I want to say it's unique, but we don't operate in a vacuum. So what we tell our kids is everything we do is a skill, and that could be doing a, a an isometric push up to working on you know a we're working on some type of decision training activity to, you know, one of our parts of our pre-training, you know, um, where we're doing our, our, our absorption drills, um, everything we do is a skill. So I don't want, you know, them to think, okay, all right, this, this, I'm coming to Jamie or I'm coming to the U of strength. This is separate from sport because I want to make connections. I want them to say, this is part of your sport. This is part of the process. And then when we're in the program, I don't want them thinking, okay, we're doing speed work and then we're doing agility work and then we're doing strength work. It's all integrated. And so that's something that we're very careful. And this is something, especially at a young age, you have to be very, very careful with what words you use and how you interact with the athletes. And I'm not just saying from a, from a, a coaching cue standpoint and a feedback standpoint, I'm talking about, you know, we don't call it warm up anymore. We call it pre-training because anytime I use the word warm up, kids are like, yeah, okay, great. We're going to go through the same thing. So we, we're very careful with kind of how we say things where we call it pre-training. And it, it, I mean, when we break it down, there's a lot of different components. It is part of the training. So we just, you know, we're very careful with kind of how we, uh, how we, how, how we, uh, communicate with the athletes as well. So I love it, man. That was a lot of great stuff right there. <laughs> I went in a different direction. Sorry, man. <laughs> no, that was great. And I think that what was best about it is it really ties in with your Instagram account. 
And I think that a lot of the stuff that we're looking at right here really fits into that open versus closed idea of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So how about we dive down that rabbit hole and some of these things that you're doing up there when it comes to that area? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think it is important. So basically how we how we look, we have only so much time. Obviously, it's a different situation than, you know, at the collegiate or professional setting where there's more regulations, there's more restrictions, limitations, et cetera. But at the same time, this is this is a business. OK, so we have we have specific time frames where groups come in, groups come out. So I need to prioritize. I need to say, OK, this is what we need to cover. This is what this athlete needs. Or this is what this athlete needs at this moment in time. And so I kind of and each athlete is different. All right. And throughout the program, everything. We have, a, we have a focus, we have an emphasis, and then we individualize, um, but we need to prioritize. And we need to say, okay, if this is being addressed, and this goes back to not having that idea of putting everything into nice little compartments, where if I'm addressing this in, in the strength portion, then how can I be more, how can I add more value and be more productive with the speed section or the agility or whatever it may be? Um, so we, we really try to have that integrated approach, all right? We do, and obviously context is everything you need to understand who, and because every time you'll say, you know, it depends. Um, we do do some closed drills. All right. I know I don't, um, I don't post much about that because when I look at the closed drills, it's purely for contextual, uh, from a contextual standpoint and really just trying to teach um, and allow the athlete to feel and how we do that in a closed setting is we, we typically, we either address it in the pre-training or we use some type of implement, okay? I love and I'm a huge fan of really allowing, especially if you're doing it in a closed environment, allowing the athlete to feel and let the implement, whether it's a light med ball, whether it's a, a dowel, whether it's a light band, all right, let that coach them, okay? And let them kind of figure out because even in that, we're very, we're very, very, and this is something I'm not going to lie to you. This is something that I have to, I've had to work on because I'm very passionate and I'm very, you know, I want what's best for my athletes. And so it really was tough for me to say, oh, okay, I need to step back and shut my mouth, really watch, see, see what the athlete does, communicate, kind of let them tell me what they feel, let them tell me kind of uh, what they felt, like what they did wrong or what they did right, get their, you know, feedback instead of me saying, do this, do this, do this. Um, and how we do that is allowing the tools or the environment to kind of dictate different things. So we will do different closed, uh, closed drills. So if you want to say from a technical model, all right, obviously we focus on, and just to give an example. So basically if we have an athlete, um, and he's coming to us, whether or he or she is coming to us and we have, you know, say it's a three day or four day model. All right. We're always going to do some type of linear and some type of lateral multidirectional. And within that, we try to keep it simple, man. That's one thing when I was, you know, when I was working under Coach Boyle, you know, that was the KISS principle, man. It's just keep it simple, especially with this age. It's really, really important, especially some of these ideas are complex. And don't get me wrong. And sometimes I'm trying to do on a daily basis, taking some of these, these really complex uh, ideas and really trying to simplify it. And I still need to do a better job. All right. But I am working on it and I, we really are trying to find a way that 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 works best for each individual. Um, but we uh, when we look at so we have a linear day and so we have OK, we have acceleration. We have max velocity. All right. One unique thing with a in a, in a if you want to call it a technical model. All right. Where these athletes can feel attractors, hard skills. All right. Whoever you're talking to, but where they can feel these you know, these commonalities. All right. Um, we teach, uh, initially everything in a vertical posture because anytime you get a kid, especially a kid that's trying to develop and learn anytime you're trying to get him because his sport coaches are always telling, get low, get low, get low. And so they always try to get low, get low, get low, but they can't physically handle that. So we, we typically teach everything upright. All right. We teach the front side, back side mechanics, and we try to keep it really simple with, uh, we our cue is a knee punch to work on that front side, and we teach punch the ground or attack the ground. All right, we keep it really simple, but we teach everything in, in an upright posture. And then what we do with other other drills or activities throughout the program. So with with and we do plyos with everyone with explosive strength, 
with our strength work, we let those other exercises and, and it's and it's strategically, but we design these other and construct these other exercise activities and drills to allow them to feel that lower position. So basically over time, as we transition, okay, out of this upright to gradually get to them to lean, 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 and everyone's gonna be different. That's one thing. Not everyone's gonna be at a perfect 45 degree angle. All right. And the, another thing that is is interesting is that you can accelerate from an upright posture. Um, I just when you if you look at sport, a lot of times it's walking, it's jogging, and then it's go. Um, so we try to we teach everything upright, especially from a linear perspective, and then allow other activities and drills with other biomotor qualities kind of help them feel and, and and appreciate their body angles because everyone's different. And if if you're working with hockey guys, especially with me, which a majority of our guys are hockey, all right. They don't know how to sprint. Nothing. They don't understand this this sagittal plane, this linear plane. It's it's very very challenging challenging for them. And then on the same point, you know, with skating, it is completely opposite from sprinting. Um, so we're very very careful um, with how we how, with how we approach sprinting. But at the same time, my and my guys sprint year round. Even on by higher level guys, we're in season we will microdose it. But we will um, we do sprint our our uh, we sprint all of our athletes, especially our hockey guys. Um, but anyway, so we use, we'll, we'll use a technical, a technical model. We, we, we will use closed drills. Okay. So to teach, all right, acceleration or teach max velocity. All right. We will pick a couple movements. It's very simple, whether it's a shuffle and we can go into more depth about this, but whether it's a shuffle or whether it's a crossover, all right, we will do some closed drills, whether it's in and it all depends on the age, but a very simple example with athletes are in our developmental group, which is the high school age. What we find to be effective is that we typically will do a, a problem solving activity, a closed drill, and then another problem solving activity. OK, so with a problem solving activity. All right. We'll have an emphasis. So if it's a linear day, I'll kind of go along this theme of, of, of our linear focus. All right. If we're um, if we're focusing on acceleration. We'll do some simple problem-solving activity to start, and this is falling right either at the end of our warm-up or right after, um, right after our pre-training. All right, we'll do some type of problem-solving activity where it could be a real simple. All right, it's a one-on-one. -on -one, all right, we're working on a reposition step. All right, you guys are side by side. Whatever guy, kind of like a mirror activity. One guy steps back, the other guy steps back. All right, you have to the the the. We have an offense and defense. The, the, the defender has to replicate whichever. If, if the offense steps back right foot, defense has to step back right foot. And then you react. Defense reacts to the offense. And then whenever the offense stops, defense has to stop. So something really, really simple. All right. We'll, so we'll go from where they're, they have to react to some type of information, some type of sensory information. Um, to we'll look at that. So we'll look at, you know, every single athlete because we don't have and I know I'm kind of going different directions, but th there's a lot of different things that go to this. Um, we will net we'll have options for for our, our, our closed drills. So for so, for example, if we see someone that has a real hard time um, with a uh, with so say with a with a knee punch or something like that. OK, we will take. We'll have three different options to do. So we'll have a, a, a knee punch. We'll have um, a knee punch in a in a in a vertical uh, with more of a vertical posture. We'll have you know a knee punch with more of a lean. We will have um, a uh, where and also we'll 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 do that with some type of load. But what I'm trying to get at is that we will take whatever we see from that initial problem solving activity. We will then say, OK, we're going to do this drill with these athletes, this drill with this athlete, this drill with this athlete. And so we will try to individualize that so that we can take we can see kind of what they need. All right. In a, in a reactive, open setting, then we'll break it down into a close, let them feel it. And we will really in, in that close drill. I'm talking about this might be one rep. Really, really simple. We won't say anything. We will, we'll, we will say, okay, this is what you're doing, guys. Let them feel it. And then once that happens, all right, we see kind of what goes on. If a kid, all right, is struggling a little bit, then we will intervene, all right, because obviously we want to make sure that, because this is a business, that everyone is, is, is understanding and is going in the right direction. But for the most part, 
after that, we do whatever. So say it's some type of marching. You, 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 it's a five yard march. We do one rep of that. We see everyone and everyone kind of stays is, is in that bandwidth and it, and it, and it looks and it, and it, it, it looks acceptable for each athlete. Then we'll move on to the next problem solving activity. And then from there with that problem solving activity, we'll try to increase the complexity or, and when I mean by complexity, we might, you know, it might be something where we increase the workspace or we go from it was the initial problem solving activity was in a stationary position to then where athletes are starting both from an acceleration position. We might vary the perceptual information where all right, they have to react to some type of sound or some type of touch and pressure or they need to you know, react to two opponents where one opponent is doing some type of you know, jab step or, or we call it a fake step. And then they have to react to the, to the real opponent where the, the person then accelerates and depending on the activity, we will we do a lot of, of, of task constraint um, construction where we'll we'll put whether it's cones, whether it's lines on the field, whether it's whatever it may be, flags, all these different things where we'll allow the kind of the task constraints to push them into a linear focus or into a lateral focus or into this part of the workspace or into that part of the workspace. Um, so we basically go from a, 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 a lower level problem solving activity with, with less information, whether that's sensory, whether that's kinematic. Then we go, we see from, we see what's going on from there. We might have like two or three drills. We'll then integrate that with, with the, and then we'll kind of bucket athletes saying, Hey, okay, this is going to happen. This is going to help you. This is going to help you. This is going to help you. And then from there, then we'll go to our next problem solving activity where it's just it's it's just a little bit more I don't want to say progression because I have changed my mindset in that but it's just more information maybe either depending on what we're trying to do if it's if it's more of a decision making type idea we'll keep this the, the workspace smaller so they have less time to react or if we're trying to do more of a one on two one on three two on three three v four all right then we'll increase the workspace um, so we're trying to give them more information um, you know, more information to perceive um, and to ultimately try to come up with some type of movement solution. So I know I kind of, uh, there was a lot of, lot of different things right there, but what I'm trying to get at is that we go, we really try to allow the athlete to see because every single day it's something different. And that's the really unique thing with the age that we work with is that kids, they develop, for the most part, they develop pretty, they develop quickly. And it's one of those things where they, whether it's a, we focus more early on with a coordination, you know, they, they will pick up on things quickly. So you might have an athlete on day week one, day one. And then when you come week two, day two, they might be a different, different person. And so we need to take that, those intrinsic dynamics. We need to take those abilities. We need to take that into consideration. Um, so it's really unique because these kids can, you know, they're developing at different rates. Um, we really, uh, it's, it, it's, it's fascinating. It's a really, it's a really interesting, um, dynamic, but. And yes, I love it because now you're looking at a consistent fluid periodized approach in which you're identifying things through the warm up in order to improve and constantly progress performance. Yep. I love it. I love it. And I think that what you do a really awesome job with is sharing things. So Jamie, where can people that are sitting here going right now, holy shit, that was a lot. Where can people see more about what you're talking about right now? Yeah, honestly, everything, you know, all the social media platforms, uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, website, the U of strength.com. Um, the handles, uh, is the U of strength, uh, Email you a strength at gmail.com. Um, that's the best way to get at me. And honestly, I'm pretty good. Um, I try to get back within 24 hours to anyone that reaches out because I think that, um, especially what you're doing, and I wish I did this at the beginning, um, but I want to say thank you because there's a lot of time, a lot of effort that goes into these podcasts that people, they don't realize. And what you're doing is that you are getting a bunch of different perspectives, a bunch of different coaches, practitioners, researchers, and coming from all different, you know, areas of the world, 
working with different populations. And we're, the common goal is we want to we want to have an impact and we want to help. Um, and what you're doing is fantastic. And so honestly, through with what you do on the podcast, that's what I'm trying to do uh, with social media. And anyone that reaches out, I, I try to get back. I try to give whether right, whether you agree or you don't. Um, I try to give you my thought process at, at the current moment because I'm always changing my my ideas. I'm always trying to find, like I said, that right piece or that right tool. Um, but I try, I try to, um, I try to be, um, I try to, I, I, I try to get back right away. I try to be as helpful as possible. So, well, you're doing an awesome job with it, man. Because you're putting out a lot of great stuff, and I really appreciate the kind words and. I mean, with this, I, I don't think that you could be any more open and honest with what you're talking about and how you're sharing. So truly grateful for the past 40 minutes, man. This is absolutely fantastic. I, uh, I can't thank you enough for the time, Jamie. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jay. I appreciate it, man. Have a great day. You too, man. We'll be in touch real soon. Thanks. And a huge thanks to the U.S. Strengths, Jamie Smith, for spending the time with us today. Guys, open, honest, candid sharing. What else could you ask? I mean, the guy's telling us from day one to however long they're with him, how he's working with these kids, what he's looking at, the alterations he's making, how they're progressing, so on and so forth. Absolutely sensational stuff. I cannot thank Jamie enough for spending the time with us, and I also can't thank him enough for all the content that he puts out and shares uh, through all the platforms. So go ahead, make sure you're giving him a follow at the U of Strength. I mean, it's it's definitely some unique stuff, and it's going to make you think, and it's going to make you kind of ponder what's going on, but it also is going to help you come up with ideas of your own. So Jamie, once again, man, can't thank you enough for the time. Can't thank you enough for all the sharing and, and all you're doing to help us all be better. Truly grateful for it, my friend. And as always, everybody, if you did enjoy the talk, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. Again, we are just trying to get the best information out there possible to all the great coaches that we can. And as always, guys, thank you you for everything that you do for us here at central virginia sport performance we will be back next week with another awesome guest we will see you then